Hello, people. This is uh, Mark and Laura from Coach Works. Guys, I hope you are well. I would like to know what you think about the uh, what goes around comes around. A couple of videos that we've made, and we're going to make some more. I think it's really important that we have a good understanding and a grasp on the importance of that because consider bad seed bad harvest good seed you got it however laura and i we both have had toxic relationships in the past what i wanted to talk about is what happens to the person who is toxic, whether they be knock or whether they are just plain and simple nasty, because they can be, they want to be, not necessarily like the knock who has to be. I want to talk about what happens when that matures right now we know people like this how they become different as if the potency has increased the nastiness has become purer by becoming more so concentrated Let's talk about toxicity versus corrosive. During the lockdown COVID-19 phase in the world, we've said this before, both Laura and I, we've said this before, that it is as if the world is being squeezed and there's this exposure of the narc trait, the narc behavior, the narc attitude. On the flip side, people are becoming aware that narc relationships are devastating. Yes. It is as if their eyes are being opened and they come to an awareness. Wow. My husband, my boyfriend, my wife, my girlfriend, my brother, my dad, my mom, whatever, they're not quite who they claim to be. It is as if they peel a mask off and you see the true colors. Yes. This is what's happened in the last couple of years, at least. From my observation, that's what I've noticed. A lot of separations, a lot of divorces, a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of disgruntled people because of this issue. And if we package that in one little box and say, knock. Now, if you've been in a knock relationship, you know, you understand what I'm talking about or what we are here talking about. Yes. It's not fun. That's that's a fact. It's very difficult to break away from that. So let's not let's just discuss toxicity in a relationship. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give you an example, which a very good friend of mine gave me. Consider going for a walk okay. down a country lane, or um, maybe not so much in South Africa because of the violence. <laughs> but uh, yes, <laughs> not going to happen yet. <laughs> yes, I want you to imagine that you're in England and it's totally safe, right? And you're going for a walk down a country lane and there is horse manure 
on the road or dog manure or you're in a zoo somewhere and the animals have just toileted wherever they find the toilet because let's be fair at this animals don't necessarily flush after they've done what they needed to do because it is what it is now as people mm -hmm. and you step in that manure let's take the metaphor and say that that is toxic it's a it's a toxin isn't it it's it's not, it's not, doesn't smell good. It's, if you digest it, you're going to be pretty ill. And so if we look at that as the example, dark manure, horse manure, whatever the case might be, if we compare that as a knock relationship, right. toxin, mm -hmm. what, what, what happens now? What happens now? after you stepped into that dark dirt down the street, or you are in a zoo and you don't know, you're not looking where you look, you watch where you're walking and you are. <laughs> okay. Um, your first response would be to find the nearest tap and wash it off, okay? Um, that could do till you got home and then you just probably chuck it in the washing machine or scrub it with a scrubbing brush and some good chick or detergent or something to get rid of the smell and stuff. Um, with regards to a toxic relationship, I think it's a continuous pattern because when you're in that, in that relationship and you get exposed to the same, for lack of a better word, abuse all the time, it becomes the norm. So you keep on washing it off, it just becomes a way of life. It's like doing washing. You know, oh, well, yeah, we go again. Let's wash it off and you keep going. Yes. Okay, so that's a toxic relationship. It becomes a way of life. Yes. And you don't see it. Okay, let's take our little example and let's up the ante a little bit. Okay. You... And you slip. And now it's in your clothes. And it's all over your arms and your face and it's in your hair. Gross. I know, it's, it's violent. I've got, I've got ways with words. Now, but you've only just arrived. And you know that you've got to be there for the next two, three, four, five hours. Tell me what you think. I would find the nearest shower. I would go home and stay. No chance. Not a freaking chance. Okay. Um, but for the sake of the metaphor, um, I think, like I said, it becomes a way of life. So, you know, you might start off with just walking in it and then it, it gradually gets worse. And it gets to a point where you're covered in it 24-7 and you don't even know it. Correct. Right. Let's take the metaphor one step up. <laughs> but you can't escape. Mm. You have to stay there for whatever amount of time. Yeah. Right? Let's just pretend that you cannot go. Yeah, you cannot leave. Right? And now it's all over your arm. And it's all over your clothes and it's in your hair. Now, to me, it's at that point that I wish I had baby wipes. True. So we need a new baby wipe, please. And you <laughs> do your bestest to get rid of the evidence, so to speak. Correct. Mm -hmm. Now, now, here's the thing. Sorry about that, folks. There's people trying to contact. Now, here's the thing. When we identify that we are in an arc relationship, and we realize that things aren't quite right, 
<laughs> we grab the nearest baby one. Metaphorically speaking, and we are trying to get rid of all the evidence. Yes. And may I suggest that at this point in time, that baby wipe cleaning up process is when people ask you, how are you? Sure. And you come up with a line, I'm okay. Yes. I'm coping. It's fine. Sure. I have a tough day, but I hope for a better tomorrow. Those kind of messages is the baby wipe thing. Sure. I've done it. I've done it for 20 odd years. Sure. Laura, I'm sure that you've done it yourself. Sure. If you have a relationship, folks, you will nod your head and go, yes, that is true, because it is. But why are we forgetting one thing? Uh -huh. It's not the stepping in it that really matters, at least not at this particular point in time. It's not the fact that we fall and we are all now covered in it. It's not it's in our clothes and it's in our heads all over there. And we've grabbed the baby wipes and we've got rid of all the evidence. But there's one thing that we can't escape from just yet. Uh -huh. And that is the smell of said evidence. Correct. It's going to follow you. You uh -huh. can wash your, your shoes, you can wash your clothes, you can baby wipe your face, you can baby wipe all out of your hair. But for at least a few minutes, if not hours, the evidence of falling into this manure is going to linger with you for quite some time. Correct. Correct. And this is where a lot of people come to the awareness of they fell, they dirty, they, and now they smell. Uh. Because the evidence of knock abuse leaves a foul odor in your mouth. It leaves, uh -huh. you, it leaves you disappointed. It leaves you upset and even guilty. Uh, in, in some cases. And you have to deal with not only the evidence, but you've got to deal with the smell of the evidence. Yes. Before you can say, I'm now totally clean and I'm rid of this stuff. Consider. Mm -hmm. It is the same as standing by a bunch of rubbish bins by a dumping site where you take all your domestic waste and the place reeks of whatever. Uh -huh. As people, once we become aware, we can just move away from that area. And for with a not relationship, we can just move away. Now I say that as if that's easy, it's not. The point I'm making is there is opportunity we can. So it's a possibility. We can move away from it. We can leave yes. the stench arena, the stench venue to keep on rotting away. That's fine. But in order to do that is hard work. Yes. Folks, that's a metaphor for narc relationships. They trip you up. They will smear all their stuff all around you. And then the evidence can be wiped away, but it's the smell, it's the smear campaign. Yes. It's the triangulation of friends and family. That's what we're talking about here. Yeah, absolutely. But let's consider something else. What happens when that toxic person matures? Mm. Now they become corrosive. Correct. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example that when people are destroyed by acid, you know, you get these people who do stupid things. 
or they're working with a corrosive substance and it lands on their arm, their leg, their face, their body. See, with a knock, we can wash ourselves, we can get that baby wipe, we can go for a shower, we can go for a bath, and it all disappears. When that matures up to a place of becoming corrosive, just like the acid, when that falls on your skin, you can wash that away all you like. Your skin is still going to burn for a substantial amount of time afterwards. Correct. And when that heals, there's going to be a mark of some sort, a scar, to indicate you were the lucky one, you've survived. You and me, we have many such scars in our lives, have we not? Yes. See, once you wash yes. yourself from a narc relationship, the poo, there's no evidence, there's, there's nothing to remind you that you've got, you've had poo in your hair. Uh. But when people become corrosive, that knock yeah. on steroids, yeah. here's the thing. You might work with a corrosive substance when you were five and you dipped your fingers in this corrosive substance. And when you're 95, you still have the evidence of the corrosive substance Sorry. doing its job. Sorry. That's 90 years down the line. Sorry. So what I'm saying here is, when you deal with toxic people, we have to bear in mind that they can mature into corrosiveness. Absolutely, yeah. They mature off, don't, don't most uh -huh. people. Yeah. And the scars that they leave are the ones that most people can't undo because it's permanent. Mm, I agree, totally. Yeah. Now, we both know people like that. Oh, absolutely. So, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on those. I think, I think you're totally right. I think a toxic relationship can be toxic as well as corrosive. It can be both. In a lot of the cases, it's both because you don't know you're in it until you wake up one day and go, oh, flip, where am I and what am I doing with my life? How did I get here? And it's to deal with the corrosiveness is the hardest part because that is it's like you say it scars and that is what takes the longest to heal and like you said walking away is not that easy but when you start doing it and you do the process and you do what is necessary you get to a point where you can start healing and that is where counseling good friends um are taking time for you and forgiving you um i think that's a big one because people you know, very quick, you know, how, you know, how could you do that? Because you don't know you're in it until you're in it. Because that's how deceptive these people are, whether it's a knock or a, any other disorder is beside the point. They are deceptive and they are master manipulators. You don't know you're in it until you've way far gone. And um, it's to forgive yourself and to start healing and get the help you need. Yes. And to find people that understand because everybody goes, Oh, yeah, they understand. Not everybody understands. Until you've had knock experience with people, you have no idea. And that's a fact. You and I both had people where we start speaking to them, they go, oh, never. And then they start thinking about it and it starts making sense. Yes. And especially with lockdown, I think people have become more aware of the whole um, narcissistic existence of these people and that they are more than we realize that there are traits people have that are very narcissistic and people have just accepted it over time because that's who they are in their DNA. And unfortunately, a lot of these people are in their DNA. That's who they are. You cannot change them. Correct. Now, you talk about deception. Have you noticed that the most prolific knock they're very nice at the beginning, aren't they? And then they spin their webs and they build up the poison and they start biting you a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there. And 10 years down the line, 15, 20, 30 years down the line, you are riddled with poison. Uh -huh. 
if they start nice and then gradually they become their true color. Yes. And yes. most people don't recognize it because it's so gradual and so subtle. Mm. And then when you realize I think, it, hey, boom, still. Yeah. Right. I think, you know, when you've been in a relationship like that, like I said, you've got to deal with the decision. But I think what's, I don't want to use the word worse, but I think what is harder to deal with is when you have parents that are knocks. Many of my friends have parents that are knocks and they're nearing 50, 55, 60, and they turn around and they go, oh my word, I didn't realize. But you're born into that situation. You're not going to know any better. Mm-hmm. And that's even harder to deal with. And then when people go, oh, you can't say that. That's your biological parent. Uh, so what? That's, yeah. You can be, anybody can be a sperm donor or an egg donor. Um, it takes a lot more than that to be a decent parent. And um, I think that's a hard one for a lot of people to accept because especially in us, okay, South Africa, especially, I don't know what it's like in England because I haven't been there yet. Um, you brought up with this thing, you have to respect your parents and they're always right and blah, blah, blah. And that's not always the case. Mm-hmm. We are led to believe that. And a lot of the time they're not. And then you have people that are broken and totally shattered that end up marrying knocks and you go, how the hell did I get you? Because you don't know any difference. You've been brought up in a family with parents that are knocks. Correct. Which leads me to, anything you know. Yeah, which, which leads me to the point that monkey see, monkey do. Mm-hmm. When you're in a toxic environment, there's a massive chance you might not necessarily, when you have children, they might not necessarily be knock, but they will certainly express knock tendencies. Correct. Absorb the atmosphere of knock. Mm -hmm. And they see knock. Mm -hmm. So chances are they'll behave knock, but that doesn't qualify them as being a knock. Yeah, there's a huge difference. Yeah, so when you see a second generation knock, they're quite powerful. But when you see a second generation that they not knock, but they express these tendencies, it just goes to show how cleverly and effectively knock and manipulate and change the mindset of people who are not. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily to believe that they are, but that they, they can twist and manipulate the behavior to mimic that what they are, and not necessarily what the next generation is. Now, here's the thing. What happens to that second generation that then has the third generation? Now, I've said this before. You can't teach someone something that you don't know. So if the child has been brought up in a knock environment, this arsenic environment, Uh guess what they do to generation three? Generation four, five, six, seven, eight. And before you know it, that whole bloodline is toxic. That in my mind, that has a exponential chance of becoming corrosive. And Absolutely. chances are it will be corrosive by generation two, if not three. Mm. Because it's so, dare I say, cultural and traditional yes. that this is how we do it. Yes. That there is no mm-hmm. other way out. And when you see other right. people behave differently, well, what a stupid way of doing things. Mm-hmm. Know, that's just crazy. But they don't realize that they've been shaped and molded into the knock like mold. Uh-huh. And they can't break free because they've been cast in stone. And that's very difficult to deal with. And I've said before, you know this as well as I do from, from a, a therapeutic perspective. 
Only when you become aware of something are you then empowered enough to say, boom, I can do something about this. Or yes. I'm happy to stay like this. But to me, awareness is by far the most important key. Mm. You don't got to I think, nothing. Mm. I think kids that come out of lack of a very narcissistic homes, um, a lot of the time, one parent is, one parent isn't. Two knocks can't be together because they'll kill each other. They, they recognize each other too often. Mm-hmm. So the saving grace and hope I have there is that having two parents, obviously you half one and half the other, that that, and I'm going to use this very loosely, that goodness of the one parent shines through eventually because a lot of the time these kids that come out of narcissistic homes have issues, whether it's learning disabilities, mental health issues. So they're going for counseling and stuff, Okay if they're in the right system and they can get the counseling they need. So my hope is that by getting that help they need, whether it's through counseling at churches or schools or wherever, that they're realizing and they come to the realization of what they've grown up in and they can make the choice to change. Because I honestly believe, yes, you can come out of a narcissistic home, but at a point you decide to be a narcissist or not. You can blame your childhood until you're blue in the face. There's a point where that person decides to be like that. And Absolutely. it's a choice. Yes. And people argue with me about it, but I honestly believe it's a choice, whether it's subconscious or not. It's a choice that is made. And I do believe that there is hope. As long as we can get the kids help and they sit down and, you know, you get different problems that come out of it. We can do a video on that problems that come out of lots of cystic homes. But if that child can get the help they need and see the difference, there is hope. It's not a total doom and gloom, but it's to get those kids the help they need and to let people understand and hear them and listen. Because a lot of the time it's, oh, stop being stupid, stop being disrespectful when they're not actually. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. There is hope, but it's for those kids to get the help they need to be able to get to that point. If they don't get the help they need, we have a major problem. Yeah. Because so it's a diamond spiral. Heck, let's just look at that now. Let's consider the sowing of the seed scenario. When that seed of knock is sown, mm-hmm. you have to uproot it before it takes root. Correct. So you need to jump on these things early. But here's the thing. Only someone that's objective can see that that's poison. Right. So how, yes. how do you become, we can maybe talk about this on another on, on another video. How do you become objective when you are subjective to particularly right. not? Let's, let's talk about this next time around. Absolutely. Totally agree. Okay. Folks, there you go. All the YouTube out there, like, share, subscribe, comment, hit the bell, click call. Important stuff, this one. I'd like to hear your story, and I'm sure Lara would like to hear your story too. Maybe not the details, but I'm sure that you too know people who have demonstrated the ability to bully, manipulate, and destroy with ease. Because that's what they're good at. So there you go, folks. Whatever comments. But for now. This is Mark and Lara from Color Change Works, and we'll speak to you soon.